All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Benzo Warrior Community Roundtable Zoom meeting. Tonight we have a special guest, Justin Hazori. We are Hello. Hey, Justin. <laughs> we are excited to welcome Justin Hazori as a guest speaker to our Zoom Roundtable meeting. Justin is the administrator of the Facebook group Goals Over Benzos and author of Resilience, A Guide to Surviving, Withdrawal, and Defying the Odds, and just had his audiobook published today. He talks, yes, I am. Yay. Sure. He talks about the importance of finding positive outlets during withdrawal, not only to pass the time more quickly, but to help com combat the severe depression that comes with benzo withdrawal. The theme of goals over benzos is not to focus on all the things we will do once we're healed, but to focus on doing the best we can with what we've got while we're still in the healing process. Maybe you're a member of his group, have read his book, or you've heard him speak in an interview on YouTube. You'll love hearing him speak with us in person today. And guys, please help me welcome Justin Hazori. Thank you. Hello. Well, I definitely appreciate the introduction. Um, I am still not that awesome at talking to people, so I'm just going to stutter and stammer my way through this, and hopefully everything will be all right, but I was very excited when you and Barbara reached out to me and asked me to come and hang out with you guys for a little bit. I'm trying to get out of the sun. Of this. I know this lighting is kind of horrible, but, um, but anyways, yeah, so I wanted to come on here and hopefully give some experience strength and hope with what I have gone through so far with coming off of benzos. And I personally came off of a pretty high dose, um, eight milligrams of Klonopin, which I think we can all agree is kind of a stupid high dose. Um, obviously I didn't start off at eight milligrams, um, but when it was all said and done and I checked myself into rehab, I, my tolerance had built up to that point. Um, and so anxiety, specifically social anxiety, has really been a lifelong struggle for me. And around the age of 19, I am 33 now. When I was 19, let me see if I can get it. When I was 19, I decided I was fed up with it. And I wanted to change my life. I knew that it was holding me back in so many ways. And I mean, I was damn near agoraphobic at one point in my life before benzos had even been a part of it and I wanted to change that so I decided to seek out a lot of self-help um, I started seeing a therapist and there was about a six-month transition where I kind of put myself through social anxiety exposure therapy boot camp so to speak and just really put myself in a bunch of situations where my skin, I, where I was just crawling out of my skin. Um, but I would, I made it through those scenarios and I found that it would thicken my skin. I realized that nothing really bad happens. The only thing that you gotta, the only uncomfortable thing about it is just the anxiety itself. So I made a lot of self revelations. And I went from barely being able to leave my house to being able to, you know, I was 19 at the time. So go to parties, go to on dates, rock out job interviews, and just finally be comfortable in my own skin. Um, and once you're finally comfortable in your own skin, after a, basically your whole life of not being comfortable in your own skin, I used to describe it as like every day I was waking up and I would just swan dive into a sea of happiness because it just felt so good I felt alive for the first time but unfortunately when I was 21 I had a I guess you could call it a relapse so to speak of anxiety and I had a panic attack I'm gonna try to there we go this might be a little bit I had a panic attack that was so severe when I was 21 and none of the breathing exercises that I had uh, learned from my therapist were working for this specific, uh, this particular panic attack. And I didn't know what to do. I, I knew I had to be at work in the morning and I didn't see how I was supposed to function. And I mean, my job was just being a cashier at that time, but I, I couldn't see, I didn't see how I was gonna be able to even drive to work. Um, I didn't know what else to do, but I managed to somehow drive myself to the emergency room 
they gave me a little 0.5 milligram thing of Xanax and less than like 15 minutes, this behemoth of a panic attack just completely went away, which to me was a freaking miracle. It was a lifesaver. I just couldn't believe that something like this existed and I was so thankful for it. And my uncle, who was, uh, if I didn't mention that, he was my therapist. Um, he, he had suggested benzos pretty early on in the process because uh, he said I had a pretty severe case of this social anxiety. He didn't even call it social anxiety. He called it social phobia. Um, but I had resisted the Xanax. I was like, no, nah, I got to do this by myself. I want to do it on my own. But tonight, you know, that particular night with the panic attack, I was like, nah, give me whatever you got. I need something. And so they sent me home with a two week prescription of this 0.5 milligram Xanax and less than two weeks, my body became completely chemically, physically dependent on this stuff. And if I went a few hours without taking, you know, the regular time dose, I started feeling all those wild symptoms, the derealization, the bad acid trip feeling, the paranoia, you know, the huge eyes, barbed wire intestines, floating out of your own body, all that stuff. I started feeling that within like the first two weeks. And, you know, that's kind of common talk for me now. But at the time, I had no idea what the hell was going on, except for the fact that it was related to this pill. And I tried to explain it to my therapist. And it's not that he wasn't empath empathetic. It's not that he didn't believe me. It's just he didn't understand the severity of what I was talking about. And doctors and nurses and people at AA meetings, they just kind of, you know, straight up. The medical people didn't believe me. And the AA people, they also didn't understand what I was talking about. So even though I desperately wanted to get help, I didn't feel like I could. I mean, I felt in this regard, 101% alone in the universe. And I just accepted my life sentence right then and there. And so what proceeded after that was just about six, almost seven years of just trying to get through my day without running out of pills. And it took me to a lot of dark places. Um, you know, I never became a thief or anything, but I was always emotionally and financially bankrupt. You know, I, I could never keep a job. Um, I could never travel anywhere because I always had to plan out my when I take my next dose. And it's just in the back of your mind, when you know that if you run out of this pill, you're screwed. That plays just such and uh, it takes such a tremendous toll on your psyche because I would be laughing with friends. I'd be at a barbecue, hanging out, drinking, having a great time. But in the back of my mind, it's like, if I run out of these pills or if somebody steals them or if a freaking dog eats them, I'm screwed. And so I just got so tired of living like that. Um, but I thought that getting off was a complete impossibility. Um, I had in involuntarily been ripped off countless times at this point at one one time I went to jail, I had to stay 50 days there and they didn't give you medication there. Um, so, you know, I experienced cold, tur cold turkey withdrawals then. And then, you know, I had the experience of going to detox facilities where they do the whole shebang of ripping you off in less than a week. And so I knew what withdrawals was all about, but I figured, um, you know, it's not that it was impossible to get off, but it was just impossible to live any type of sane, normal life. And um, so if it was up to me, I would have stayed on benzos for the rest of my life. But logistically, I couldn't. I mean, that, that's just all there was to it. I, I always ran out of money, which meant I always ran out of pills, which meant I had a call in from work and I would lose whatever job I had. And um it was just a dead end road. And I, you know, it's not, it wasn't for a lack of trying. I fought the good fight for about six years, but eventually it got to the point where it's like, all right, well, it's either get off this medication or kill myself. And I used to call the suicide hotline multi, I mean, quite, a, quite often. And I would just tell them, you know, I know I'd be crying to the lady and I'd just be like, I know I'm meant for big things in this life but I can't accomplish any of them because I can't escape this prescription dungeon 
is what I used to call it. Um, so it, it's not like I just picked up and went to rehab because I, you know, it felt like a good idea. There was no other option. It was do or die. And I actually texted my older cousin and I was like, man, you know, I, I might have a seizure. I might die. I mean, I had already had a seizure before in the past um, by cold turkey. I had ran out of medication once again, and I had a seizure that was so violent, it dislocated my jaw and broke my back in two places. And if you see my shoulders are unaligned, that was from the seizure. Like it was so violent, it really screwed me up. And that happened right on the floor of the doctor's office of the, you know, the doctor who was prescribing me the medication. So I knew what I was up against. I was texting my cousin this, and he was just like, man, well, if you die, just die trying. And so that was my, that was my commitment. Level. If I, if I end up in a psych ward or whatever, so be it, I'm getting off this medication, 120% commitment. So when I checked myself in, I think the doctor could see and hear in my voice, how serious I was about getting off. And I, and I told him, I was like, look, man, I've done this two weeks bullshit about, you know, you guys just ripping me off. Um, we're either going to do this at a slow pace or I'm not doing it at all. I'll walk out the door right now. And like I said, he, he took me seriously and he could see I meant business. And so we decided on a, it ended up being like a seven month taper. Um, the program that I checked myself into was for about four months. And they actually ended up letting me stay for about six months because I really worked the program. And they could see I, I was really doing everything that I could. And I believe that the reason that this, um, this rehab experience was so good was because it was a slow taper. And I wasn't already in full-blown withdrawal uh, right from the get-go, right? You know, if, you, if you're in withdrawal and you already have aphasia and can't talk, people just automatically think you're a freak show and they they don't have respect for you they treat you like a second class citizen but this time they could see like my outgoing personality they could see um my positivity my energy and they got to know me as a person so as the dosage went down and the symptoms started to elevate and I became more withdrawn and more quiet and more serious um they they knew like okay something's going on um, but on the outside, that's all it was. It was like, okay, Justin's a little more serious now. Justin's a little more withdrawn, a little more quiet. They didn't see like, oh, Justin's completely freaking collapsing on the inside here. And in like a fourth dimension <laughs> withdrawal universe and, and dealing with some evil shit right now. Um, so I made it, I made it through the seven month taper. And once I got off, it went from pretty bad to what I define as the spiritual Holocaust. And I don't think I need to go into the, uh, all the details of what that entails. I think spiritual Holocaust kind of sums it up. And just, just to, uh, just to let y'all know, I thought that my laptop was on charge for a good hour just to find out that I wasn't plugged in all the way. So if it seems like I'm rushing at any point, it's because I'm trying to fight the lifetime of this laptop, but um, I think it'll be okay. So, you know, I got through the taper and for about six years, my mom didn't really believe me when it came to how severe the withdrawals were. She didn't understand why I, I refused to get off the medication. But when she picked me up, my first week of getting completely off the medication and she saw my crazy, like huge eyeballs and freaking out and not being able to talk correctly. She knew like, okay, something, something is seriously wrong with my son. And so I would just, I, I you know, like everybody does, I Googled the symptoms and how long will this last? And you get a huge time span from, it might last six months to three years. So that wasn't much of help because it's like, all right, well, which one is it? I can't do this for six months. And I, I really couldn't function as a human being. I had to move to Georgia with my dad 
And for the first four months, I was completely incapacitated on the couch. I call it the fetal position days. I felt like I had battery acid in my veins. I was agoraphobic. I couldn't leave the house and just terrified. I mean, felt like I was possessed by a, a chemical terror demon. And when I looked in the mirror, it actually looked like I looked like a uh, a horrified demon possessed ghost kid, and um, just just evil shit. And that lasted. I mean, the first eighteen months for me felt like I was trapped in a bad acid trip. The first four months were the worst, with the battery acid and um, not being able to talk. You know, I had to move with my dad and my dad's a very vocal uh, at that time, yelled a lot. And, um, you know, I couldn't defend myself vocally and uh, I just felt helpless. And it wasn't like I could just hang out in my bedroom while this was going on and just wait for time to heal. I had to go. I had to get a job <laughs> on this freaking crab boat. Right. Uh working for $50 a day, sometimes over eight hours on this nasty, smelly crab boat. And um, this would be a hard job even now, right? But you throw in bad acid trip feeling floating out of your own body and barbed wire intestines. I, it was, I was definitely, I hate to use the S word, but I was definitely suicidal. And I ached for death day in and day out. And it was one early morning where I, I, I didn't see, I didn't see any hope. And so I grabbed my phone. I typed in YouTube. I typed in why shouldn't I kill myself? And the first videos that popped up were some like spoken word about depression and then they didn't really speak to me, but I stumbled across a video, a motivational video in all caps that said, I can do it clicked on the video and I'm not sure if you guys have ever seen this type of stuff, but it's like a compilation of motivational speakers and powerful music and very like raw, raw speech. But, and it's what I needed to hear at that moment. And it gave me such a, a mindset shift just for that day. It was like, you know what? I am going to do the best job I can out on this fucking Sorry for my language on this freaking crab boat today. And when I get home, I'm going to watch another motivational video. And I'm going to try to figure out a game plan. And I'm not just going to, I mean, th this didn't all happen overnight. You know, I didn't just watch one motivational video, but that day I made it a point and I made it a habit to, I'm going to watch a motivational video every 30 minutes and listen to empowering music every 30 minutes. And that's how I'm just going to get through my day emotionally. And my motto was, if my brain is working against me and I can't think for myself, then I'm just going to let these motivational speakers think for me. And what happened over time was I began to develop this mindset, and this game plan of, okay, I'm not just going to survive withdrawal. I'm going to accomplish goals in the process. But, you know, when you're in this situation and you're in a agoraphobic mess, what goals can you possibly accomplish? Well, for me, my first big goal was, I mean, I couldn't leave the house uh, besides my crab boat job. And the only reason I had that job was because it was just with one other person. There's no way I could go inside a building and like actually clock in somewhere. Um, this was with one other person on his nasty crab boat. I couldn't make eye contact with them. I couldn't talk. It was just dehumanizing um so so what goals was i supposed to do i found playing guitar really i had acasthasia i know some people have um some people have like extreme fatigue i was the opposite i felt like i was plugged up to a car battery all the time i couldn't sit still i felt like if i laid down for even a second i was going to implode with all these horrible feelings and so I found the guitar, which helped me with the acastasia because it meant my mind was like focused on something and my fingers were constantly moving, which was like a new outlet. And since my shoulders were messed up and my back was messed up, I couldn't have the physical outlet 
that I had when I was in rehab, which used to, I used to do like hundreds of push-ups for the physical outlet. So guitar was more mental. And because of the acostasia, for the longest time, I couldn't just sit there and stay disciplined enough to just learn what these instructors were saying and how to play the guitar. So I had to really build my way up to it. I mean, at first it was just like 10, 15 minutes at a time. And then the next day I was like, okay, I'm going to try 12 minutes. And it just started to expand from there and compound. And sooner or later, I got to where I was playing eight hours a day of guitar. And it provided me, it, it helped me get into like a flow state and it helped me to keep my mind. I mean, I was still in this like all encompassing sorrow and hell of withdrawal, but it started to create some positive momentum for me. And, and it may, and if nothing else, it made time go by so much faster. So I started to get some positive momentum and the idea came to me. We have this little stretch of road out here in the country and the idea to run my first marathon popped into my head one day. And I didn't just, I mean, I was still agoraphobic at this time, so I couldn't just go out and run on this little stretch of road. We actually had to call my aunt and ask her not to, if they, if they somebody saw me running on the stretch of road, please do not stop and talk to me because I was too scared to talk to her. And um, I mean, at this point, they had already tried to drag me to family gatherings and I had to suffer through quite a few of them. But um, anyways... So I was still in the thick of it when I, I started training for this marathon and I, I started to document the training and stuff. And I think people uh, got the wrong idea because they were seeing me post guitar videos and marathon training stuff on these Benzo sites. And I think they got the wrong idea. They weren't negative. They were very supportive, but they're like, oh, you must be feeling so much better because you're doing these things now. And that couldn't have been farther from the truth. You know, like my, my one of my favorite motivational speakers, Eric Thomas, says, you know, don't cry to give up, cry to keep going. So me personally, I was I would cry when I I mean when I was playing guitar. I would cry when I was on the crab boat. Luckily I'd have glasses, so he couldn't my boss couldn't see. Um, but I would cry while I was training for this marathon. And um, but I with the power of discipline, I just did it anyways. I mean, there's no other way to say it. I just kept on doing it. And it was like my way of proclaiming war against withdrawal. It is like, you have taken everything from me, but you're not going to take this. And so once I completed, and, and I was, at this point, I had been very transparent with my friends back home. Like, so when I got a lot of support on Facebook from my friends in my hometown and people who I'd never met before. Uh, the way that I saw it, I was kind of like, if you watch America's Got Talent <laughs> and they, everybody, you know, it, it's always just some kid that you never expect anything from. Who's got some horrible backstory, either they got cancer or their mom just passed away, but they have this talent and it's like their muse and their outlet for all this horrible stuff they're going through. That's how I felt with the marathon. I'm like, all right, I got this brain injury and I've lost everything, but I got marathon running. And so when I completed my first marathon, it just kind of opened up my eyes of like, okay, with discipline, I can really actually still get things done with, with, uh, even though I'm in withdrawal. And if I can do these things while I'm in withdrawal, just imagine what I'll be able to do when I'm out of withdrawal. And so it went from the marathons to the, uh, I, I learned what an Ironman was. An Ironman triathlon is a 2.4 mile swim followed by a 112 mile bike ride, um, followed by a marathon, 26.2 mile run all in one day. And so I needed something like that to train for because it gave my mind, it, it, it was bigger. It was a goal that was almost bigger than withdrawal. You know, when I would go to work, I was an insignificant, agoraphobic, couldn't complete a sentence, couldn't talk. I mean, just couldn't express myself at all and got treated like a freaking idiot 
day in and day out at, jo- at my job. So that was demoralizing. But when I would get home and I would put on my dad's beat up old running shoes that weren't even meant for running, I became, it's like I was putting on my cape. It was the only way I could feel serotonin. And even then it wasn't that much, but it was like, okay, I'm putting on my cape again. I'm going to war against withdrawal. So I got addicted to this feeling of like, I'm going to war against withdrawal. And I completed that Ironman, but I completed another one. And so after a while, <laughs> I got tired of going to work and putting up with these demoralizing incidents and these bosses who just didn't understand my situation. And I decided I'm going to take this discipline. I'm going to figure out how I can make money online. And I don't want to go to these bosses anymore. If I'm never going to, you know, at this point, my mind says, like, if I'm not going to yield, I can at least make money from home where I don't have to be subjected to this world that doesn't understand what I'm going through. At least I can make that happen. So at that time, I didn't know what options I had except for something called medical transcription and something called drop shipping. That's all. There's really a whole galaxy, a whole universe of opportunity out there. But at that time, that's all I thought there was. So I decided to uh, enroll in this medical transcription course. And one thing that really helped me get through this course was because, you know, my brain was still scrambled eggs and my self-esteem was non-existent. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll rephrase that. I had self-esteem, but I didn't have any confidence. Uh, I knew that I was doing like pretty epic things, but I didn't have any like pump. I didn't have any confidence because withdrawal stole it from me. So what helped me was there was a motivational speaker named David Goggins and he runs like these 200 mile plus races. And he's just a kind of a freak show that way. I'm not a big fan of him. Um, but one thing that really resonated with me was he's self he's kind of self-proclaimed as stupid and he's got some type of learning disability. And at one point in his life, he wanted to enter, he wanted to become a Navy SEAL and, but he didn't have the academics that he, you know, um, like everybody else. So what he was saying, he was like, man, I had to study four times harder, four times longer than everybody else. I was going to get into that Navy SEAL program. And he did. And I mean, he did have to study four times long harder and that spoke with me. So I, you know, I, I grabbed that message and I was like, all right, man, I might have to read these paragraphs over and over and over and over, but I'm eventually going to get these grades. And I'm going to turn in these assignments. And at that time, that was like my academic Mount Everest. And I ended up passing the test. I failed a few, but I was turning in my assignments and I ended up passing this medical transcription course with the 80% average with a freaking brain injury. And I, w- I couldn't have been more proud of myself. And I was able to share this experience with goals over benzos, this Facebook group that um, we had put together where the whole message is that, you know, what can we do while we're still healing? And I was, you know, left to my own devices. I never would have tried this kind of stuff. Stuff, but I was filling my mind with nothing but documentaries of people who had athletes who had lost everything to like ALS, but kept on finding different ways to express their uh, go getterism or whatever, you know. And I would watch documentaries of this one bodybuilder guy. I don't even think he was a bodybuilder. He actually was, um, I think he was kind of a louse before he was paralyzed, but he, he got paralyzed. And after his accident, he began weightlifting. And, you know, obviously he couldn't do like the deadlifts or anything like that, but he found that he could bench press. And he became, he started winning championships with, uh, with the bench press and his wheelchair. And so I would fill my mind with stories like that. And that's what gave me the war juice, you know, the motivation to keep going through with, with my own goals. And my my interview experience with this medical transcription company uh, that I got hired by was um, 
nothing glamorous, right? You know, I cry. I was so scared. It was, this is Zoom interview. I was so scared that I was crying. I, I didn't know what else to do. I just started crying during the job interview and I didn't know what else to do except explain to them what I had been through. And luckily they were a lot kinder and open-minded and open-hearted than um, the old redneck bosses that I had been working for. And so I got a job with them and I quit my, uh, at this time it was a long care job. And I was finally able to just heal in peace by myself in the comfort of um, my home. Now, medical transcription, you know, I want to be completely candid about this. Medical transcription is a dead end job, right? Like I don't live by myself. I'm not a homeowner or anything like that. I could not pay the bills with medical transcription, but what it did was it opened up. It, it, it took me down the rabbit hole of seeing what else is out there. And it eventually led me, I saw that this was a dead end job, but it led me to finding else, what else was out there. And it was, um, I stumbled across video editing and I took a business course on how you can grow a business with video editing. Um, and there's a whole list of skills. It's called a virtual assistant, technically. I mean, I'm a video editor, but the course is for people who want to be virtual assistants. And there's a whole list of skills that people can do from home. I just gravitated toward video editing. I have three clients now. Um, I've given myself a raise three times now. And it's something that I love doing. And it's not a dead end road. Uh, my, my, um, my big goal is to turn it into take, you know, first get it into full-time work and then turn it into an agency by hiring other video editors. And hopefully this is going to sound corny, but hopefully make the type of videos, the same type of motivational videos that used to get me through my hard times. You know, I don't, I kind of go between, I, I don't really try to be all serious in my videos, but um, you know, that's, that's the idea. So all that, all that to say, like um, like Lisa was saying in the beginning, the whole point, the whole message of the book and the goals over benzos is to do the best we can with what we got while while we're still healing. And as you guys can see, you know, I have to wear these doofy glasses. I highly recommend these doofy glasses. They um, they're called blue light, and they're really meant just for looking at a computer screen, um, but they actually help with the overstimulation issues. Like if I take these off, all of a sudden my eyes kind of feel like they have electricity behind them and it's hard for me to focus on my surroundings. I mean, that's gotten a lot better, but I still have issues. And there was a pretty defining moment in my life for just for myself that me and my mom were walking on the beach one day. This was about year four or five. And I just turned to her and I said, you know, I might never live a normal life again. I might never be inside an office with, uh, with a big host of friends or have like some big wedding or anything like that. And I've accepted that. And I just told her with every bit of determination I have, I was like, but I'm going to make the absolute most with what I have. I can promise you that. And I, I was recently on a podcast and I, I kind of finally was able to sum this up in one sentence pretty nicely with a bow on it on that podcast. And I just told the guy, I was like, look, man, if all I have to work with is this guitar, this little stretch of road and this laptop, then just watch what I'm about to do with it. And I've been on a mission this year to I, I've been running a marathon every weekend and I'm on. I just completed marathon number 38 of 2022. I just completed my very first marathon in under four hours, which I've been trying to do that for about three years now. Um, so on the outside, you know, the, the, the life that I live is not glamorous. I am kind of just an introverted hermit in the woods right now. 
just trying to grow my business, but I'm able to find purpose in it. And I am not the end all be all case of this, right? Just because I haven't returned to quote unquote, the land of the living doesn't mean nobody else has. I am in touch with people who have 110% rejoined the land of the living. Um, I see this one lady who I'll see her at pool parties. I'll see her singing karaoke and just doing her own thing and really going for it. And I asked her what her secret was. And she said it was something called DNRS. And apparently it was only like 300 bucks and it was some type of therapy. And she, it changed her life. And there's another lady who got her master's degree in withdrawal. I mean, actually going, all my stuff was online. She would be going to a facility, got her master's degree, and now has a job. Um, obviously, it's not what she got a master's for. She's probably in between goals right now, but she's got a job as a waitress. I mean, just think of all the hustle and bustle and socializing that comes with that. So a lot of healing had to happen for her to be able to do that. Um, so there is hope. Um I don't want anybody to think like, oh, God, I'm just going to be in the woods working on my a business for the rest of my life. But me, I love it. I, I, I guess I'm a workaholic in, in some sense. But that is how I've gotten through benzo withdrawal. And um, I'm very determined to live a pretty kick-ass life regardless. So that is, that is it in a nutshell.